Who is this? My name isn't important. What matters is that the answer is in the pyramid. The pyramid? That's ancient stuff you're talking about. Are you sure? Bring up the pyramid. What, what is it? What is it for? We built the pyramid a long time ago to illustrate how much people should eat of the four basic food groups. Sir, we abandoned the pyramid when Michelle Obama got involved. The pyramid doesn't work. We've already tried it. It's upside down. What? Sir, the pyramid is upside down. Turn the pyramid upside down. You can't be serious. That would put butter and fat at the top Flip of the... Flip the damn food pyramid! This is not FDA approved! It's dinner time on the East Coast in ten minutes. Now do it! Sir, we've got a match. Nutrition is stabilizing. We've got a well-balanced vaccine, sir. Yeah, so South Park has become real. The food pyramid has been inverted in the new dietary guidelines. And while I was worried that these new guidelines would be a disaster, I'm pleased to report that there's some really encouraging aspects and my worst fears were wrong. Equally, though, it's not all roses. So let's start with what's gone right and then we'll have a look at what's less than ideal. Now, every new iteration of the dietary guidelines should build upon and improve what's become before it. So the original food pyramid, for example, it had major issues. For example, it was too grain heavy. It minimized healthy, unsaturated fats like extra virgin olive oil. So in 2011, it was completely scrapped for my plate, which was a huge improvement. So in these new 2026 guidelines, they do not replace the old food pyramid. And this is a really important point. The new guidelines do not replace the old food pyramid. They replace my plate. So my plate focused on whole unprocessed foods. And I'm pleased to say that the new guidelines, they build upon that base and have got whole foods as their focus. And we can see this in the intro to the guidelines. They say that the central message is clear. We need to eat real food. And then they go on to talk about what that actually means. So we should prioritize whole nutrient dense foods and whole grains. Hang on a second. Whole grains. What do you mean? The new guideline diagram has whole grains at the bottom. So it looks like we should be minimizing whole grain intake. So should we be prioritizing whole grains or should we be reducing our intake? So more on that shortly, because that's something that hasn't gone right in this new set of guidelines. Now, coming back to what has gone right, one aspect that wasn't given enough attention in the old MyPlate guidelines was protein intake. So protein guidance was based on the recommended daily allowance of 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. But is that really an adequate amount? Because you've probably noticed the trend. We keep hearing that we need to have more protein and we see more protein shakes, more protein bars and protein snacks that are everywhere. So is that 0.8 number too low? Well, there are several reasons for high protein intake that can benefit our health. So for instance, muscle mass is a key concern as we get older and we start to lose muscle mass from about the age of 30. And then that loss accelerates as we get older, particularly during times of illness and bed rest. So muscle mass, it can decrease by as much as 50% between the ages of 40 to 80. So strength is connected to muscle mass and that of course drops rapidly too. So of course this is a serious matter. The declines, they reduce mobility, they diminish quality of life and they can lead to fall related injuries. So the crucial question here is whether that 0.8 gram per kilogram of body weight per day is adequate to help us maintain and rebuild muscle mass as we age. Because on the flip side, an international group of experts, they urged for a higher protein intake of between 1 to 1.2 grams of protein intake per kilogram of body weight per day. And the evidence supports this recommendation. So for instance, an observational study, it looked at protein intakes for adults between the ages of 70 to 79. So those with a daily intake of around 1.1 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. They lost 40% less lean body mass over a three-year time period compared to those whose intakes were closer to that 0.8 gram target. And since muscle mass begins relatively early in life, it would make sense to raise that protein intake when we're younger to a level that maximizes muscle gains. Now, when it comes to muscle building, you'll often see a target of 1.6 grams per kilogram of ideal body weight per day talked about online. Now, that's probably a little bit high for most people because a newer meta-analysis uncovered a significant inflection point around the 1.3 gram target. So up until that level, Increasing protein intake had a large impact in terms of increasing lean body mass, but after that, the effect was much more modest. Plus, there's a small weight loss benefit with high protein intakes as well. So, for example, one meta-analysis showed that this benefit, it ranges from between 1 to 1.6 grams of protein intake per kilogram of body weight per day. Goodness me, that's a mouthful. But even at the lower range, again, we're still well above that 0.8 gram target. Now, this is where the new guidelines get it right, I think. So they recommend between 1.2 to 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight per day. And that's significantly higher than that 0.8 figure in the old guidelines. So those were the MyPlate guidelines. 
guidelines, and they recognize that there is a range here depending on factors like age and activity level. And the new guidelines, they also continue past advice to vary our protein sources. So we do want to have a variety, including animal sources, as well as things like beans, nuts, and seeds. And there are many other things in this new set of guidelines that are basically the same compared to what came before. So we're told to eat a variety of colorful, nutrient-dense fruits and vegetables. We should avoid sugar-sweetened drinks and added sugars. We should keep sodium intakes below 2,300 milligrams a day. But there are three places where the new dietary guidelines have got some problems. So first, and this list is in no particular order of importance, is the approach to fat. Now, this is an area where there's been a lot of speculation before the guidelines were released. So many expected that these new guidelines would remove any language warning against saturated fats. And indeed, at the press conference announcing these new guidelines, RFK Jr. declared that they were ending the war on saturated fat. Now, in the scientific report published alongside the new guidelines, there's an extensive discussion of the evidence about saturated fats. It argues that we don't have good evidence that if we lower saturated fat intake, that would lower our heart disease risk. And then there's the appendices, which were also published with the guidelines. So that document includes a new meta-analysis on studies on saturated fat intake and heart disease. And it takes aim specifically at the common target of limiting saturated fat to 10% of calories. And that 10% level was the figure used in the prior set of dietary guidelines published back in 2020. So what do these new guidelines actually say about saturated fats? Well, here's where it gets a bit confusing. So despite everything that we've just looked at, the guidelines retain the guidance that we should limit saturated fat to no more than 10% of daily calories. At the same time, it's clear that the emphasis has shifted in the new guidelines when it comes to fats. So they say that sources of healthy fats include meat, which we should probably hear as red meat here, since poultry and seafood are listed as well. They also suggest butter and beef tallow as options when cooking with fats. Now, red meat, butter and beef tallow, they're all very high in saturated fats, and they definitely weren't recommended in previous guidelines. And the mainstream health advice is to limit our consumption of these. The guidelines also recommend full-fat dairy. Now, this is another department. So previous guidelines recommended low-fat dairy products, and the reason for this earlier recommendation was to avoid saturated fats. So we can see that some of the evidence of Kennedy's claims to end the war on saturated fats, they are showing up here in the guidelines. So red meat, butter, beef tallow, and full-fat dairy, they are all encouraged. But this is in tension with that 10% guidance. So here we're centering our meals on animal-based proteins and frying stuff in beef tallow. So it's going to be incredibly easy to just blow past that saturated fat 10% limit. So it's almost like the guidelines, they can't make up their minds. Should we be limiting saturated fats or shouldn't we? The overall picture is quite confusing, and I'm going to cover the link between saturated fat and heart disease in a video coming up shortly. Now, the second issue with these guidelines has to do with the methodology, because it doesn't look like they're applying it consistently. So here's the issue. In the scientific report, they lay down a rigorous standard for evidence. So they say that we need to prioritize randomized controlled trials instead of observational studies. And the reason for this is that observational studies, they don't make conclusions about causes. They can only uncover potential relationships. Randomized controlled trials give us much greater confidence that we understand what's truly going on. So when we're dealing with dietary guidelines, the stakes are high. They can have profound impacts on food systems and on dietary habits across a population. So we want our recommendations to be grounded in the strongest possible evidence. So the priority is randomized controlled trials. The report also says that they will focus on actual clinical outcomes rather than surrogate measures. So in other words, they want to measure how dietary changes actually affect rates of heart disease, for instance, not just blood cholesterol levels. And the reason is that these changes in surrogate markers, they don't always map onto changes in clinical outcomes in the way that we might expect. So the authors don't dismiss observational studies or surrogate markers, they just say that they've got their place. But they also want to anchor dietary guidelines in experimentally tested relationships whenever available, using other kinds of evidence for context. And this emphasis on randomized clinical trials and clinical outcomes is why they find the evidence on saturated fats unconvincing. But then it looks like a different story when it comes to highly processed foods. So as we've seen, warning against this kind of food is a major theme in the new guidelines. So does that mean, for instance, that we should be avoiding protein powders? Should we avoid plain Greek yogurt, cans of beans, or cans of lentils? And then there's another problem. With a strong warning against processed foods, you might expect that we've got good, randomized controlled trials focusing on clinical outcomes to support that guidance. But the meta-analyses that they've prepared as part of the scientific foundation admits that this isn't the case. Instead, they write that the evidence base is almost entirely 
observational. And this is a good illustration of how assumptions that we bring to the data will have significant impacts on the conclusions that we ultimately draw. For example, if the author started with the suspicion that saturated fat was guilty until proven innocent, then their recommendations might have gone in a very different direction. So let's move on to one last issue with these new guidelines that I want to highlight. It's the inverted pyramid graphic itself. So as I mentioned at the beginning, the original food pyramid was abandoned way back in 2011, and partly that was because it gave us a distorted picture of a truly healthy diet. This new pyramid, it runs a similar risk. So to the left, the image is dominated by a huge steak, a massive chunk of cheese, ground beef, and a whole chicken. There's a lot of saturated fat represented here, and the proportion sizes seem inflated. In contrast, super healthy plant-based protein sources, like chickpeas and lentils and beans, they're nearly invisible. There's a pile of beans at the top of the rice bowl, but it would be easy to miss it. And it misrepresents what's actually going on in the guidelines themselves. So for example, whole grains occupy a tiny slice right at the bottom, despite the recommendation being two to four servings a day, which is roughly the same compared to the previous MyPlate guidelines. So nothing has really changed here. And finally, just like with the older pyramid, the graphic isn't super helpful for knowing what a balanced healthy meal actually looks like. So eat real food is a great slogan, but the challenge comes in with knowing what real foods to eat and in what proportions. So what I steer my patients towards instead is Harvard's healthy eating plate. So it's similar to my plate, but with some updates. So it specifies whole grains and healthy proteins, and it includes healthy oils like extra virgin olive oil. And visually, it's really easy to see what a balanced meal actually looks like on your plate. Canada's food plate is another fantastic visual example that's easy to explain to patients in the clinic. And if you find all of these guidelines and health advice confusing, don't worry because in this next video here, I'll explain three simple evidence-based principles that will help you to consistently create meals that add up to a longer, healthier life.